she's on the train. She's on the train. She's on the Okay, so good morning again for those of you I haven't seen. Val. <laughs> Actually, we had fun. We had a very we had a very intimate session. This one on one. It was interesting. Um, hope you're getting a lot out of this this morning. There's a lot of different things going on, and this, we're going to kind of go through an overview of relationship smarts. You're all using relationship smarts, everybody. Everybody, okay. So. This isn't intended to be a training on relationship smarts, not in 45 minutes, but kind of an overview on some of the issues, some of the things that are in it. Again, some of the key topics, just as a bit of a refresher, <coughs> kind of go through it, give you an opportunity to ask some questions, ask me some questions if you if you need to. Uh, I do have one very short, very simple activity um, toward the end. Nothing, nothing spectacular, just something to get you thinking about a few things. So, relationship smarts plus, we're using 3.0. There's going to be a 4.0 version. Uh, we'll talk mostly about 3.0. Most of you already know it's evidence-based, um, and it's an integrated skills curriculum. What we're talking about here is, is designed for positive youth development. It's designed to help you with your students, with your participants, developing some basic life skills. It's designed, of course, to help them understand what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, we've been talking about this all morning. What we've discovered is that a lot of our students, a lot of our participants have not a clue what a relationship is, uh, good or bad. They just are. They're in, so they're in what they believe is a relationship, but we know it's not. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Relationship Smart's approach to dating violence and uh, pregnancy prevention, how that works into the curriculum. It uses some different learning strategies. They're realistic. If you're already teaching it, I believe, and, let, and you know what? I want to be really um, informal about this. If you have a comment about it, bring it up. Let's talk about it or, you know. With, its, with our group. Um, it's relevant. Have you found that it's not relevant anywhere? Or that it is more relevant to some of your students than others? Probably, probably you do. Um, it, wants, it helps us look at, it helps our students look at personal aspirations, love, intimacy. What does a successful relationship comprise of? What's it look like? Um, motivation to help them with behavioral changes. Can we motivate them to change their behavior? Yeah, we can if we provide them with good guidance and good examples. And importantly enough, it helps them through their self-awareness. It empowers them. Okay. It will help them provide relationship knowledge, practical skills. I think we could probably all agree that a lot of our participants, a lot of our students have no practical skills when it comes to what a relationship is or what a relationship should be or how to get into or out of a relationship. Um, I think it's been delivered through some very fun activities. Uh, what do you think? Do your students like the activities? Most of them? Do they participate in the activities? Yeah, some of them. Some of them are probably pretty shy, at least at first, if they're like any most teenagers. They, oh, an activity, does that mean I have to get up and talk? Or do I have to mean that I have to get up and pretend to be somebody else? Or just get up. Or at least, yeah. <laughs> at least get up. Yeah. That's I mean, yeah, it does. But uh, we're finding, and we found over the years, that once they get through that first or second time, they start to like these. And so this is a really good curriculum. It has some really interesting activities. Um, the workbook. The interactive part of the workbook where the students have an opportunity to record their own thoughts or uh, take, I don't know, I won't call it a quiz, but take an assessment of themselves maybe in certain areas. Um, it helps them understand things in their own life, I think. And I think hopefully they think that too. Um, the parent-teen activities, conversations with parents or with trusted adults, that's a big issue in any curriculum, and I particularly like the way uh, 
Relationship Smarts handles it. One of the things that I've always tried to do when I work with the students, which has been a while now, but is early on, I ask them. They don't have to come and tell me. They just have to understand. Is there a trusted adult in their life, whether it's a parent or an uncle or an older sibling, a, a clergy person, someone they feel comfortable enough to go and speak with, who will talk with them honestly. This curriculum encourages that and it gives them some activities that they can then, well, we call them activities, but we don't want to call it homework because if you mention homework, they're not going to do it. Um, things that they can go, maybe ask a question or some guidance that they can take back to that trusted adult and have a discussion. That, I think it's more important, or it, well, I think it is more important, that they have that discussion with someone other than me or you as a facilitator, someone that's close to their life. Now, in a lot of cases, you are their trusted adult. I've had, Michelle and I have talked about that before in her classes, where we've said, I've said, you have a trusted adult, and we've talked about it, and then we take a break, and I'll have had two or three students come up to me and say, I don't have anybody to talk to, can I talk to you? And I've given them my phone number and said, sure. I've only had one student take me up on that, but still, they have to have someone to talk to, so we have to encourage that, and this curriculum does that. It encourages them to do that. And also, it uses popular media and activities, and you've been talking about, I bet, media most of the morning, other things. Is there any doubt in your mind that this particular device or something similar is not driving their lives right now? Val and I talked about this earlier this morning. I have an acquaintance that refers to students now as the head down generation because all you see them walking down the hall like this or walking down the street like this because this device is ruling their lives. You know, it's funny because at my age, I look at this thing. I have my cup of coffee in the morning, and it's everything I can do to not pick this up and go, I wonder what happened last night. Well, while I was asleep, what happened last night? Now, I think I'm a mature adult, and so I understand that I don't need to do that. I can read the news or whatever I want, when I want. But our young people, some of them live and breathe what comes out of this device, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone or an iPad or their computer or whatever it is, they go to that first and look to see what happened last night. What did Jane say to Sue or whatever, however they post this stuff now? What's it called, Snapchat? I, I don't have it, so I don't know what it is. But anyway, it talks about those devices, and it has activities to encourage them to learn about the effect of this stuff, of media, on them and what it does. Some of the key topics. And I apologize, I'm developing a cold. I'm getting a little dry here. I'll stay away from you all at lunchtime. Um, one of the key topics is self-awareness. It helps, this curriculum helps our students understand their personal strengths and their weaknesses. We were talking in the last session that some of these students, when asked, what's, their, what's one of their personal strengths, or do you have confidence? And they say, no, no I don't have any confidence. I don't have any personal strengths. But we can help them recognize that they do. And this curriculum helps bring that out. It gives them an opportunity to look at themselves and say, oh, yeah, that, yeah I, I, that's me. That's me. I, I do have, look, and I, yeah, I do have some things that are strengths. I also have some weaknesses. It's okay. How do you fix a weakness? First, you've got to recognize you have it. So uh, it talks about past influences. That could be family influences, that could be friends' influence, that could be any type of influence, a, 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 a critical or catastrophic event in their lives, a good event in their lives. So these kinds of things impact their ability to have relationships. And most of the time, they're not aware of that. So we have an opportunity to make them aware of it. Talks about setting goals, how important that is. Talks about peer pressure. Do we have any doubt that peer pressure plays a huge part in these kids' lives? The way they act, what they do. Sometimes we think,
they wouldn't be involved in this particular group, that would be one heck of a good kid. But he's involved, or she's involved with this group, and that influence, but they don't see that. They see that as becoming a part of something. They want to be a part of a group, a part of a social clique, if you will, that gives them some kind of satisfaction, even if it's wrong. Um, talks about this curriculum works with them on maturity. There's a, a maturity assessment that they do. That they do, not us, they do. They look at it and they say, oh, yeah, that's me, that's me, no, that's not me. And it kind of gives them a scale to look at. See, how mature are you? And why is that important? Because if you're not mature, or not working towards becoming mature, how do you have a mature, healthy relationship? So it all goes back to being strong in your relationships. And also self-regulation. Can you control yourself? Are you an impulsive person? These kinds of thoughts. Developing healthy relationships, what we're always talking about. What's attraction? Infatuation versus love, that kind of thing. Positive relation building, skills and blocks. What's a, what's a healthy relationship look like? What are the positive sides of a healthy relationship? What are the downsides of a healthy relationship? Is jealousy a part of that? What does that mean? What does jealousy mean? What, those kinds of things. How do you assess your relationship? Let's sit down and honestly think about it. If we're in a relationship, is it a good relationship? Is it a bad relationship? Is it really a relationship? Is it? I don't know. It helps them discover things about themselves and assess things about their relationships. Realistic, low-risk dating. We have a real problem, not just in Wyoming, but throughout this country, of dating violence, sexual assault, and our teenagers are the epicenter of it. Sure, it happens to adults too, but our teenagers are experiencing it more and more. Teen dating violence is a huge problem. In fact, February is Teen Dating Violence Month, I think. You'll get some stuff from us about that and things you can present to your students that help them <coughs> recognize that. No, it's not okay to be bullied. No, it's not okay to be grabbed by the arm or slapped or pushed or you fill in the blank. It's not okay. Um, and it talks about deciding versus sliding. Well, what that means? Well, the, what does that mean? Well, when you decide to get into a relationship, that's one thing. You're making a conscious decision. But if you're sliding into a relationship, so you've been in a relationship with someone, or we call it a relationship, or you call it a relationship, with someone for so long that you've just slid right along with it. You've gone from friends to dating to maybe intimacy or whatever, you just slid right along. You never decided to get that far, but you did, because you slid along, feeling that, well, this is normal, instead of taking the time to decide, is this a good relationship? Is it healthy? Am I healthy in this relationship? Now, dangerous relationships, breakups, out of our... <laughs> You know this, right? I don't have to do this. How do a lot of these students break up today? Facebook. Facebook, text message, right? Email, well, maybe not even an email, because that takes time. You have to compose it as opposed to, I don't like you anymore, and hit send, or you know, a frowny face, or thumbs down, or something even worse, right? Is that healthy? Of course it's not healthy. But they think that's normal. Well. John and Susie just broke up. <laughs> she just sent him a text, so I don't like Larry anymore, so I'm just going to say, you know, no, we're done. We're through. What happens then? You got get Jim in there. Larry's got, is really upset now, and maybe he wasn't the most calm person to begin with. Now you have the real problem of the real potential of abuse or stalking or things like that. They have to understand, how do you break up? What's the right way to do it? Talk them through it. We demonstrate. They have some examples, some activities that show them that how to get out of a how to get out of a relationship safely. What do you do? How do you do it? Do you stand in a big group and tell them, "Hey, I don't want to see you anymore. I don't want to see you anymore either." Or whatever. 
No, but you plan. Maybe you have some friends nearby if you need to. So support. Boundaries. What are the boundaries? What are our students willing to do and not willing to do? What's too far? What's not far enough in some people's minds? We help them establish what healthy boundaries look like. We talk about sequencing also. What's the proper sequence of a relationship? And of course, dating, violence, and sexual assault. Big, big issues. Very large issues. And a real problem. Communication and conflict. Huh. How to have a fight. How to have an argument. Do you think most of our students know how to fight fair? No? No, they don't. Can we teach them how to fight fair? We can model it. We can show them. We can talk about what are the danger signs of a conflict. Your boyfriend running up to you with a bald fist because he's upset with you and pulling his arm back. Is that a danger sign in your, in your relationship? I would think so. Or the girl walking up to her then boyfriend and being upset with him and giving him a big shove in his chest or slapping him or whatever it is. Is that a danger sign in our relationship? Yeah. Is abuse ever right? That's a question we ask our students, right? When is abuse okay? Never. Never. But do they say that? Sometimes they do. Some of them recognize it's not right. But sometimes they go, well, he shoved me. Yeah, he hit me first. He hit me first. That's right. Michelle's right. He hit me first. Well, okay. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you got into that situation in the first place. Time out. I encourage this, and I also encourage. I've encouraged this when we were doing uh, when I was doing um, premarital prep with couples a long time ago. It's okay to take a time out. It's okay to say I don't want to have this discussion right now. But it's also important to say I recognize this is a problem, and we need to talk about it. So let's take five, ten. <coughs> let's take a day. But at this particular time and in this particular place. We are going to sit down, and we are going to discuss this problem, and we're going to try to resolve it. Timeouts are okay. You don't have to solve every problem right now, this instant. But sometimes they don't understand that, do they? they got to, i got to resolve this with John right now because he was talking to Sue, and I am really upset about that. And if I don't talk to him right now, I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to go over there and smack it. Okay, wait, let's take a step back. Let's talk about this. It's okay to take some time and think it through. My thing I always tell people is, but if you do that, that's fine. Listen, we're going to get together tomorrow, right after school, 4 o'clock, and we're going to talk about this. Be there at 4 o'clock to talk about it. Don't blow it off. You've made an arrangement to solve the problem. So solve it. And then, of course, we talk about how to solve problems. And your regulation, huh, something I could work use some help with sometimes. We all get angry. How we channel that anger is what's important. Walking down the hall, kicking in lockers, or punching walls, or worse, somebody, is not the way to handle your anger. We know that. A lot of our students <coughs> work with them. We teach them a little bit. Speaker-listener technique. We've talked about this before. And we talked about it last hour, how important it is and how uncomfortable it can be to teach them, and sometimes they don't want to participate. Josh had a great example. Should I put you on the spot and ask you to do that again? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. This is Josh from uh, uh, the Center for Relationship Education, uh, Real Essentials. We're going to hear from him a little bit later today, but we were talking in a session earlier, and he talked about speaker-listener technique, and I thought this was really interesting. So. so what I do is, after teaching speaker-listener technique, which is pretty dry, uh, and kids start to tune out to it. I get two volunteers to come up front, and I say to sp the speaker, "You need to come up with a with a issue that you have in your relationship." And so they come up with one. I'm like, "All right, now, listener, you don't know what this problem is. Usually, you don't know what the problem is when you do speaker listener, and you need to, you need to confront it." And find the, what's going on in the, because in speaker listener you don't try and find the problem, you find the issue that's going on. So 
they come up and they work through it and they have the audience be the facilitator. So every in the audience is the facilitator. So they're sitting, oh, I heard an I. Oh, he didn't repeat back the reading paraphrase the right way. And then I say, halfway through the dialogue, I say, stop. Now, forget all the rules that we've been trying to teach you. Now just fight and have a dialogue or confrontation the way that you usually do it. Ready? Go. And the speaker just starts to unload on the listener, and the listener starts to unload on the speaker. And you that's a good teaching point at that point where you say, now, let's stop there. What did you see between the two different dialogues? One was intentional, and the other one was, I always call it, fire aim ready, where you're just firing things out, hoping to hit the right spot. You're not aiming. You're not working towards a goal. And they see it visually, and I say, what happens when you take time and go inside and figure out what the next sentence is going to be in that dialogue? And that's really a good idea for kids to see it visually. And then you bring up a whole other group, and, bless you, and you have them do that. And they start to see, oh, OK, OK. And it's not a cut and dry, oh, so what you're saying is, you are mad because I didn't come to your birthday party. Yes. Like, you see tangible things that the kids can grab onto. And the light bulbs kind of start going off. Light bulb. Okay. Yeah. It's a light bulb. Does moment. anyone, has, has, when you were teaching speaker listener technique, have you run into mm -hmm. scenarios that, kind of like Josh was describing, that the participants don't want to be involved? They just don't want to get up there and do it. They won't do it. They try not to do it. I just thought that was an interesting thing. You got to get a couple of volunteers. That you, what you were saying is to try to identify a couple of the outgoing students that are willing to do oh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And usually we say, I need two volunteers. I want to do it. It's always the drama kids. <laughs> I'd love to jump up front. Always the ones. Anyway, our curriculum has that, that technique in it as well as a couple of others to teach them how important it is to understand the problem. Not defend yourself. You have your opportunity to defend yourself. You have your opportunity to explain. But if you're trying to defend yourself at the same time the person is trying to let you know that there's a problem, then you're not listening. You don't, you know, nothing happens. There's no dialogue. So this curriculum gives, them the, gives us the opportunity to teach them that, as well as the opportunity to work with them on solving problems. Uh, it talks about intimacy and sexual decisions especially a pacing of a relationship and what is intimacy and in sex in the context of a relationship. Okay, earlier I was talking about this, I think Val and I talked about it. I just read a study the other day after we talk about kids, with kids, about waiting and proper sequencing for waiting, waiting for intimacy, you know, I saw a study not too long ago. I wish I'd have read the whole study. I just read the articles associated with it that was talking about sex on the first date isn't such a bad thing. And I, I read the article and I'm like, that's nothing like what we try to explain to our kids or our participants or anyone for that matter. But this is a study. And I think these kids can see this stuff because they're always on, it, on their phones or on their laptops or whatever. And they see a study like that and go, see, well, you know what, what they were talking about today in class or what they were talking about during our... Healthy relationship has oh, look, there's a study that says it's okay to have sex on the first day. They don't understand that. I don't actually understand that study at all. I wish I had taken the time to read it because I can't imagine how that was set up or what the parameters were. But if they see something like that, we're going to get confronted with it. Well, you said there's a proper sequence for everything, and we have an outline here in this curriculum. Well, they don't call it that, but we were talking about that in class the other day. And look what I found this morning. I was reading an article in USA Today or something. And it says it's okay to have sex on the first day. We need to be prepared to talk about that. And this curriculum gives us the opportunity to talk about that, not only in the fact that you know, it's better to get to know someone and to establish a friendship and establish a healthy relationship before we think about getting intimate or going, and that, although in some of our cases we have students that are way past that, right? They've been intimate since they were, I don't even know what age anymore. So scary sometimes to think about. 
but it gives an opportunity to think about that in the context of a healthy relationship. Uh, again, boundaries. What are safe boundaries? Do our young ladies have boundaries? Do they have they set boundaries for when they go out on a date as to what they will do and what they won't do? Guys, do you have boundaries as what to you will, will want to do or not do on a date? Or when you're hanging around with your friends? And it's always not about a dating relationship. It could be about a friend relationship. Do you have boundaries for that? It's the old, you know, if Johnny jumped off the roof, would you follow him? Something like that. Um, how unplanned pregnancy affects children. We work with them a lot in uh, teen parents. If they had any plans for their life, there's a real chance they go up and smoke if that happens. But they don't think about the consequences of that, at least not at the time. So this gives us the opportunity to talk about it and get them to talk about it. Sexual consent. Well, he forced me into it. What do you mean he forced me into it? Well, he was pressuring me. Well, what do you mean he was pressuring me? Well, he kept asking to have sex. And I finally said, okay. Well, was that real consent? Or did you just cave in? Isn't it important to understand that you don't have to? That you can have a relationship without being sexually involved with somebody? That we have to give them the opportunity to learn that. And, of course, how to say no. We give them that opportunity. We help them and teach them that through some activities that they can practice and learn and hopefully put into play. And I did I mentioned this before, success sequence. What is the order? School, commitment, babies. What is the order? We have the opportunity to help them walk through what a healthy sequence for life is education, relationship, family. With some of our students today, it's a physical relationship first, and then maybe we get to know the person, and oh, now she's pregnant. Oh, man, I really wanted to go to community college. Hmm. Well, gee, I hope that tire store is still hiring because I need a job now. Or they get bitter. Right? We've Unfortunately, Michelle and I have talked about this a lot. Okay. I, the only job I can get is at Burger King. You know, and I need to, I need to have a job because Susan's going to have a baby, and what am I supposed to do? I, I'm going to have to support that baby, and I can't get a job. You know, they don't know, they don't understand the sequence. We can teach them that. We can help them understand it. We can help them work towards having a plan, setting goals, planning for their life using healthy relationship curriculum like this one. Technology and social media. Mm. Constant connection. How many of the, our students that we know of are what I said earlier? They wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is grab their phone or their iPad or whatever they happen to have, and they spend their entire day in between classes, because they're not allowed to have them in class, right? Or not, unless it's an emergency, I guess. I'm not sure. Or they walk out of the class, and what's the first thing they do? They pull it out of their pocket or their backpack and turn it on or flip it off of privacy, and they're walking down the hall because they are connected, constantly connected. The problem is, what are they connected to? Facebook, what was the one we just said? Snapchat? Instagram. Uh, Instagram, that's a big one now. Instagram. Kids aren't on Facebook. Just so you know. Oh, if you there really you go. Want to know what's it's happening, it's I wondered why, I, you know, the only people on it anymore are my own. Instagram is number two. What is it? Snapchat is number one in Wyoming. Instagram is number two. Nationwide, it's a top, toss up between Snapchat. And Jeez. That's why I only see guys and gals from my 50th high school reunion on, on Facebook yes. anymore? Yes, yeah. only us old people are on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> they all just dated the myself. The kids have the anymore. profile, but that's not their real life. Yeah, right. yeah. It's right. just what they want the parents to think. Yeah. But our students, our participants, are doing this all the time. And what kind of influences are they getting? Oh my gosh. I've seen some things on Twitter. And I've read, and I've gone back and I've read it again, and I thought, how in the world did that even get on here? And I don't sign up for this stuff. 
it just shows up in your account because I happen to like something that someone else wrote, and then I have to, how do that snowball? So I don't know how that all works. And you look at that, and I think I'm mature enough to look at that and go, get rid of that. But our students, are they mature enough? Or they look at that and go, oh, look at that. That rapper got in trouble because he smacked his girlfriend, but he's not going to go to jail. Hmm. Wonder, wonder what happens. They don't think like this. I'm just pointing it out there. Maybe they get away with it. Maybe that's normal because this star did something. And with all these uh, reports of inappropriate sexual activity or inappropriate uh, things going on in workplaces now, that, are they going to start thinking that that's normal? As we're adults, we're supposed to know better. Are we the model now? And they're seeing all this. We need to help them understand that it's not right. These things are, are happening, but that doesn't make them right. And we need to be able to explain the difference to them. Realities and myths are movies, video, uh, what do you call it, YouTube videos. These movies that show these unrealistic uh, relationships that go on and on and on. Oh, it happened on this movie, and it was so happy, and the ending was so great. Okay, does it happen like that in real life? Sometimes, I suppose it does. But are they old enough to understand, or mature, back to maturity, enough to understand that that's not the rule? That's the exception. And it's a movie. It's a fantasy. It's two hours of eating popcorn and junior mints, or whatever it is, and getting away from the real world. It's not real. But to them, at their age, it is. We can help them understand that. And online porn is now a huge issue. Was, Josh and I were talking about that a little earlier too. It's a huge issue. Where they can just dial it up. They don't need a relationship. They can just dial up what they want on their phone, on their laptop, on their iPad. They isolate themselves. So they even if they want to have a relationship, they don't know how. Because what they see on a pornographic website that's not a real relationship. I don't care how they couch it. It's not a real relationship. But they, again, it's maturity. It's seeing that and going, well, that's, wow, look at that. It's not real. And we can help them develop policies or ways of handling social media. Um, you know, as parents, we have a job to do with our kids and social media. Can we restrict them? Yeah, to a point. I had a great, or not so great, uh, story about my granddaughter. She's 14. Her mom and dad are pretty strict. Pretty strict. She's not allowed to have an Instagram account because they caught her with some inappropriate friends using Instagram. So she was visiting us one day, and she borrowed my wife's phone. And she said, oh, can I look at something on Instagram? And grandparents, yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, We caught a real rash of it when we got back and found, and my son found out that she had been using, because they monitored her their account, and they saw that she had checked